uh, and it's the work of how uh, Jose Marti, Jose Julian Marti Perez, and uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson's lives um, are connected. Uh, too often uh, in a lot of the literature and scholarly work that's done on this matter, which is not very extensive, I should add, uh, there tends to be an inclination to suggest that Jose Marti took uh, or co-opted uh, much of the ideas for his own uh, political, spiritual, economic, and educational agenda for Cuba and its independence uh, right out of Emerson, as if there weren't uh, many opportunities for Marti to explore his own, or for that matter, for him to discern other options. And so what I'm going to begin is by suggesting that the life of Marti uh, and the life of Ralph Waldo Emerson are lives that are interconnected precisely because Marti found in Emerson someone who would provide the affirmation, someone who would provide the encouragement for exactly in the direction that Marti was headed. In other words, Marti was already on that track and he found this kindred intellectual spirit, this, this titan, which he himself, Jose Marti, recognizes as providing the spiritual and philosophical go for it that he needed at moments when he felt isolated, alone, misunderstood, and really without much support. And so rather than it being that Marti was simply taking, Marti was enjoying this idea that there was, there was this man, this man that was beyond nations, which Marti refers to him as. Marti saw that Emerson was a man who transcended boundaries, transcended nationalities, transcended nations and countries, and even national ideas, because Emerson looked at the spirit. He looked at nature. And because of these two items, he was able to then see that Emerson was also speaking with great potency and with great prophecy to what Marti needed to do for the Cuban people. And so, Unfortunately, there have been some authors and Fontaine and a variety of others that have also used the Marti-Emerson connection to suggest, um, you know, how Marti would eventually move away from Emerson, Emersonian views because he was moving towards more of a socialist or Marxist view. Uh, I would have to contend with that historically where Marti himself found great trouble with Marxist views, uh, he himself having read the work. I also would say that for those that are looking for an anti-imperialist persuasion, which definitely Marti was an anti-imperialist, and yes, towards the end, Marti himself finds that the views of Emerson do not fully contribute to a pan-American ideal. However, he recognizes that this is part of the limitations of the human condition, as well as recognizing that, yes, there would be some unique experiences to what Marti would refer to los Latinos. In other words, he preferred the word Latin or the Latin American and Caribbean people or Hispanic Americans uh, rather than just looking at the fact that we would just be Americans as it were. He observed and he appreciated and deeply respected and admired his experience in the United States. In fact, um, another criticism often used is that Marti would just go walking around the city of New York and he would find headlines in, um, you know, first page uh, stories and he would just simply translate them. Th this is not only under uh, appreciating the brilliance of Jose Marti, but it's also in many ways denigrating the uh, wisdom, the intelligence, and the brilliance of a man, Jose Marti, who along with Ruben Darío, the great Nicaraguan poet, were the founders of modernism uh, throughout Latin America and the Caribbean and recognized in Europe as that. And also, we have to understand that we're looking at two men who have very distinct gifts. Uh, we are all aware of Ralph Waldo Emerson's gifts and talents and education and experience and travel. But we should also make some um, affordance and allowances to let all of you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with Jose Marti, who was born in January of 1853, 
um, in Cuba uh, that he was a man who had a law degree, a doctorate in philosophy. He started several newspapers. He was well-traveled, spoke several languages, and had translated major works in historical context into Spanish and was able to um, know the works, many of them, that Ralph Waldo Emerson also did. Which then brings me to the next point, as I had previously mentioned, spirit and nature. These two ideas that really in many ways serve as the two pillars of much of what Ralph Waldo Emerson shares with the world. Um, there was this additional text that has not been celebrated sufficiently both in the life of Jose Marti and now we're beginning to see more and more and more scholarship that is emphasizing this even in the world of Ralph Waldo Emerson. But it's the Bhagavad Gita. I myself was surprised to the extent to which the Bhagavad Gita and this version in particular, which is a very easy to read paperback version with a wonderful introduction by Aldous Huxley, which I recommend, lets us see how both of these men, independent of one another, were inspired by this great spiritual text. And it's really what's found in the Gita, which they were then able in their own way to help to develop their own philosophy, their own worldview, their own way of examining the profound existential questions of the human condition and what was the purpose of the human experience. Both would agree that we're spiritual beings going through a human experience. Both would agree that it's the spiritual transformation and that the long process of life which is beautiful, which is divine, and which does not end with this chapter, because both would subscribe to this idea of metempsychosis, this idea of transmigration, uh, which sometimes is so misunderstood as reincarnation. However, they found that their political, spiritual, and cultural agenda reflected the very profound idea that as we understand the renovation and the rebirth of experience, and as we move towards a God consciousness of sorts, we're separated from the attachments of experience and we begin to look at the broader picture where everything is integrated. The political is integrated into the spiritual. It's integrated into the cultural. It's integrated into the economic. And this was fantastic for Marti because what he saw in terms of the promise of the independence of Cuba, in order for it to be self-reliant, mind you, would require a full transformation of the Cuban people. And not just at a political level, and not just at a spiritual level, but in the total transformation of the soul, the total transformation of the person, in order for that transformation to be multiplied, in order for it to become a national transformation and a national experience. If there would be a quote that would encapsulate this entire story that I'm sharing with all of you. From Marti, it was this one. From nature. The foregoing generations beheld God and nature face to face. We, through their eyes, why should we not also enjoy an original relation to the universe? And this quote, which Marti reflects on on many occasions, um, in the very uh, beautiful article and essay that he wrote on behalf of Emerson. When Emerson passed away, it was Marti's way of providing his own eulogy. It was published on the 19th of May, 1882, in Caracas, in Venezuela, in the newspaper La Opinión, or La Opinión Nacional, and uh, the National Opinion. Uh, in Caracas, Venezuela, and it was an article that he writes, this profound essay, where he takes the words of Emerson and he really begins to elaborate on what those words mean to him, both as an individual, as a seeker, as a philosopher, and also what these words would mean for the Cuban people. And it's interesting that he writes uh, as a result of this inspiration, uh, he writes, while he is reflecting on Emerson, he writes, the creator is in every man and that every creature has within something of that creator and that everything in the end will return to the creative spirit's bosom. 
that there is a central unity in all facts, in thoughts and in actions, that the human soul, in its wanderings through nature, finds itself in all her, that the beauty of the, of the universe was created to breed desire, to alleviate the pains of virtue, and stimulate man to seek himself and find himself, that within man is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty, to which every part and particle is equally related, the eternal one. So as Marti is paying homage to Emerson in this beautiful essay, he is reflecting on these words of Emerson about what is that relationship, that unique personal experience that every human being should have between the universe and God, uh, between spirit, between nature and oneself. And because he invites that this should be a personal and unique experience, completely separate from just tradition and just accepting the norms and the parameters, the vocabulary and the ritual of the tradition, but rather to really explore that intimacy one-on-one. -on -one. And so Marti takes this and he says, how would this work in the Cuban experience? And De La Torre writes these words reflecting on this. To the Cuban nation builder, Marti, he's referring to, the human spirit is a part of the spirit of the universe. Human life follows, metaphorically, the same trajectory as stars. And so the idea here is that we begin this work, spirit in me, Marti would argue. The transformation has to occur first within, where if we remember spiritual laws, when Emerson is reflecting on when we're not in communion with nature, we feel like a clogged pipe. Well, this is the experience, spirit in me, that we rediscover this intimacy with nature. And as we do rediscover the intimacy with nature, we are freed. It is in many ways similar to the whole idea, both in Hinduism and in Buddhism, of moving away, of divorcing ourselves from the attachments, which bring pain, which bring suffering. Spirit with me, that we allow the experience of history in much of the way that Victor Cousin and, of course, of Hegel, who, by the way, great, great work has been done how the French philosophical tradition influences American transcendentalism. For the longest time, we've been looking at German idealism and how German uh, thought inspired um, the American transcendentalists. But if we really look at their own work in that first generation, and we really look at the inspiration of Cousin, we'll find that both for Emerson and for Marti, the inspiration of this eclecticism, of this idea of being able to take whatever is in the Gita, whatever is in Neoplatonism, whatever is found in, in, in Kant, whatever is found in Hegel and Schelling, and then be able to reconfigure it. So it becomes a personal and a unique experience once again with the universe is exactly what Marti was looking for. Because what Marti wanted was that the Cuban people would experience the wealth of this inspiration, but they would be able to be the authors of their own experience, the authors of their own liberty, the authors of their own future. And so that there is this very powerful experience that is necessary. Um, and again, this is interesting how we look at the whole process of allowing one to not only have that transformation within, but to also allow the transformation to occur with me. And so as I become an example, and this is where Marti takes this idea that Emerson has of us being the example, and we find that in the Oversoul, we find that in fate, we find that in the poet, we find that also again in spiritual laws, we find it in self-reliance, and we find it in nature. That so we have to be an example. He then takes it to the next level, which is spirit through me, which is the third point. Spirit in me, spirit with me, spirit through me. And by allowing that, this is where Marti is able to make the decision 
that he is going to give himself to the process of independence. He is going to, like Arjuna is told by Krishna, to not worry about the sacrifice and the suffering of the body, to realize that suffering and duty is the ultimate expression of love. And so Marti is able to, in New York City, in those 10 years that he experiences there, come to terms with the fact that his life would be one of service and of ultimate sacrifice for the purpose of the independence of Cuba. And so I want to thank all of you for having listened, and I appreciate so much this time to share these great men with all of you. Thank you. My experience with that has been to really look at Emerson beyond borders, um, to, to take Emerson as a, a brilliant man, but a man of his time, a man that had much to offer, but also had his own limitations, which I think is part of the beauty of who he was. Uh, I think much has been done to sometimes make him into a god or, or, or to see him almost as untouchable. And I don't think that that's been helpful. So with my own uh, research, what I wanted to do was find the beauty in the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and, and, and to see how he did speak to someone who I was raised to love very dearly, who had his own limitations as well. Marti was far from being perfect. Uh, but I think that helps us to open up the conversation internally and, and realize that, you know, what can I learn? Sometimes the best teachers are the ones that didn't do things exactly the way we would want them to do. And so I'm reminded of what Nick Cave once said that uh, when he was speaking about this relationship between Jesus and God, he says, you know, Jesus was the son of God, but he had his father's blood boiling inside of him. And so I think that that's important. I mean, how can we take that Emersonian blood, let it boil in us, but realize that we're also blessed by a time that's very different to the time that he lived in?
Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.